they can have an impact force to the degree of actually fracturing the skull without any loss of consciousness or change in their ability to do things. Obviously, they have pain associated with that, but it doesn't change their brain function because they haven't shaken their brain around. So it's really that shaking around that's the problem. It's not just a direct impact. So that's one of the problems with helmets. They can't prevent your head from shaking. So that's why they're not great at preventing concussions. So following a concussion, you have some axonal injury. And the nerves are made up of a nerve body and then a part that goes way out and communicates with another nerve. And that's called the axon. And so that's where most of the nerve damage happens. And so there is some variable amount of axonal damage. It's very small. You can't see it on CT scan, but it does happen. And again, the majority of the problem is functional. And here is a diagram that talks about functional injury. This is pretty small because it's so far away from you guys, but this is the end of one nerve. This is the end of an axon. And this is the nerve body of another nerve. And you release little neurotransmitters from this area and they bind to receptors over here and cause uh, this nerve cell to transmit a signal. What happens in a concussion is that all of these neurotransmitters are dumped into this area and it really stimulates this next nerve. So it's really exciting that next nerve. And the way that that nerve responds is it dumps all sorts of potassium that was inside this cell, outside of the cell here. But now it doesn't have enough potassium in here. So this potassium floats around to the edge of the cell where there are a bunch of potassium channels and it tries to pump all this potassium back into the cell. And when it's pumping potassium back into the cell, it needs energy. So the energy it uses is ATP. And ATP is made from glucose. So you have all this glucose that has to be utilized in order to pump all this potassium back into the cell. And as that, as that glucose is used, you actually end up producing a bunch of lactate. You guys have all heard about you know, lactic acid when somebody is exercising lactic acid. It's one of the byproducts of, a, of the first part of metabolism when you're actually trying to produce energy. So you start getting this accumulation of lactate. And so the lactate increases the acidity inside of the cell. And that inhibits some of the cell functions. In addition, you dump a bunch of calcium inside of the cell. And all of that calcium, the cell is saying, well, it shouldn't be out here in, in the regular cell, so we're going to try to oops. We're going to try to put it back into areas of the cell where it can be concentrated. So mitochondria are these little things right here, and that's where energy is produced. So that's where they pump a bunch of this calcium into. But when the calcium gets in there, it prevents the mitochondria from producing energy. So when you look at this whole thing that happens, the excitation of the nerve, dumping out of this potassium, energy to try to pump potassium in, and at the exact same time, you can't produce energy. And so you have this mismatch between what you need and what you've got. And that is one of the issues. And it takes a long time for that metabolic process to get back to normal, where you can produce normal energy, get the potassium back into the cell, and have a normal balance of everything. So that's the functional injury associated with this. One of the other things about calcium is it causes your blood vessels to constrict. All of your nutrients come from blood vessels. So here you are, you need all this energy, and you're constricting your blood vessels so you can't deliver any of the nutrients to your cells so that you don't get energy. So all of this stuff is a real problem. So where does the excess calcium come from? Is that from the imbalance from loss of potassium? There's actually little things inside of your cell where you, where you have all the or excuse me, calcium stored. Mm -hmm. And when you have depolarization and that potassium dumping out of the cell, you also release all the calcium from inside of these little, uh, yeah, these little uh, packages, these little boxes, essentially. And <clears throat> so when they're trying to put it back into those packages, they also put it into a lot of other areas that it shouldn't go. Yeah, but that's a great question. And that local reduction of blood flow in your brain and the increased demand for energy is actually, uh, it causes what we call relative ischemia. And ischemia just means you don't have enough oxygen getting to the area that you need it to, need it to go. And this actually equates to how bad your brain injury is. The less energy you can get to that area, the less oxygen you can get to that area, and the higher your metabolic demands, the higher that mismatch, the worse your outcome is going to be. And so there are some studies that can look specifically at that mismatch. Now, although I was just talking about the functional components of brain injury, there's also a structural component. And a lot of people don't think about this, but 
in uh, animal models, if you have injuries to the animal's head, three days later, they have just a little bit of injury to the nerve cells, but they definitely have some injury. And if you monitor it over about seven days, it stays about the same. But if you take that same animal, and during the same time period, that three to seven time day time period after a first injury, and you give them a second injury, then you have this pretty dramatic increase in the number of nerve cells that are damaged. So what that means is, you have an initial injury, and when you haven't recovered from that yet, if you sustain another injury, you are way more susceptible to a much worse injury. And that is a big deal, and one of the reasons you want to be very careful about letting somebody go back into play and do any type of high-risk sport before they're better, because they're much more likely to sustain a very, very bad injury. Now, there are a lot of experimental tools now to start looking at concussions, and one of them is a thing called a magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And that's similar to MRI, it's just an MRS. And what it looks at is all sorts of little byproducts from energy production, and it gives a graph of these different energy byproducts. And if you take two of those energy byproducts and you do a ratio of them, in normal individuals, that ratio is above two. But if you take a concussed athlete, all of them are below two. And so it shows that their metabolism is not normal. After about 15 days, some of the people who have had a single brain injury are starting to get back more towards a normal ratio. So at about 15 days, about half of people have started having normal function inside their brain. But it takes 30 days for you to have normal brain function after a single concussion um, in terms of metabolism in, in your brain. But if you've had more than one concussion at 30 days, none of these people have had a return of their normal metabolism in the brain. So that's a pretty big deal. It took a month and a half before they actually got back to normal. And this is new research, and it's making us start rethinking about concussions and how long we should have people out. Because right now, I'll talk to you a little bit about, more about it later, but we do a lot based on uh, people telling us how they feel, so their symptoms, and then also some measures on their balance and measures on their thought process and how good they concentrate. But the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of those things resolve way before their brain has actually gotten back to normal function. Now we don't know whether we need to wait until their brain is functioning normally or whether we need to wait until they're able to answer our questions appropriately and their symptoms have resolved and so on. That question has yet to be answered. But if it is that we have to wait until their brain function is normalized, then somebody who gets an injury at the beginning of the season very likely will miss almost the whole season before they're allowed to go back in and participate, which will affect every major sport. I mean, every major sport. Yeah, so this is a big deal because it would essentially, like in the NFL, it would eliminate the NFL because there are so many concussions and they try to get them back within a week or two weeks. Instead, if they were out a month or two months, because all of these guys have had more than one concussion, so it's going to take them a long time to recover. Suddenly, you get one concussion and you're really out for the season. Same thing with the NHL, so, you know, so all of these things. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see how everything evolves as we find out more and more and we have better and better tests and we can monitor people's recovery over time. Did you have a I did. I just real quick. So are these professionals, the high school coaches, the, the assistants, are they uh, required to take this concussion information with so, them? So are they required so that they know their kids? So I'll talk to you okay. about, yeah, I'll talk okay. to you about that in particular here uh, in a okay. second, some of the, the laws and stuff that, that are being passed. This is just another example of it. It's, it's taking a person who has had a concussion and it's monitoring their recovery based on this uh, MRS study after their symptoms resolve. So everything, they come into the physical examination, they come into the doctor's office and they report no symptoms and their physical examination is normal. So all of our regular tests are normal. And the control has normal levels, and you'll just have to take my word for it there. But the person who says that they're symptom-free, just had a concussion, all of their levels are abnormal. So again, it's just kind of going in to prove that following symptoms and doing some of the tests that we do on physical examination are not nearly as sensitive as some of the new tests that we're going to be able to do, hopefully, in the near future. Another thing that's pretty interesting is uh, this diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI. And what it does is it looks, when you have the nerve cell body, 
and you have the axon going out and communicating with another nerve, that axon has to pump nutrients from the body all the way down its process. And so it constantly has flow of nutrients going to and from the, the end of that axon. And that's called axoplasmic flow. And diffuse, the DTI looks at axoplasmic flow. And of course, the only way you can have flow of nutrients going out and waste products coming back is if you have energy to do that. And so if you don't have the energy to do that and your cell's not working, then things shut down and you don't have any axoplasmic flow. So this DTI can look at that and normal axoplasmic flow is over here and abnormal axoplasmic flow is right there. And it correlates really well with impaired cognition, so ability to think, and with symptoms. So this might be another test that in the future we'll be able to use. Now a lot of people think about PET scans with cancer. We're using PET scans to look at a lot of different diagnostic tests. And what they do is they inject some radioactive substances into you and it goes to different areas and it measures, it, based on its concentration, it tells you how much metabolic activity is happening in that area. So you can do that in the brain specifically, and it has not been studied with concussions, but it has been studied with other traumatic brain injuries. And they found that as people have a traumatic brain injury, they'll first have this increased brain activity because they've dumped all this potassium out and they're trying to pump it back in, and then it goes through a depressed area where it just can't function well at all, and then it gradually normalizes. And that triphasic recovery has been shown uh, to correlate with symptoms and some of the different tests we've got. So again, PET scans might be something that we can use to look at concussions in the future because it's a functional test, not a structural test. And again, concussions are mainly a functional problem, so we have to use these functional tests that we're learning about. Functional MRI looks at blood oxygenation patterns within your brain, and they have looked specifically at concussed athletes and found that functional MRIs are abnormal when the athlete's symptoms are, uh, are present, and it normalizes gradually after that time period, and it correlates really well with some of their abnormalities. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the other problems with concussion. You know, usually with a concussion, things are fine. But with a, a hit to your head, even the first time, if you've never had a, a previous concussion, you always have the potential that your brain will have a response and will swell and, and it, it can kill you. That's rare, but that can happen. More common is second impact syndrome. What happens with that is somebody has a concussion and they have the standard symptoms of concussion. They still have their symptoms and they're allowed to go back and participate in a high risk sport and they sustain another injury. And when that happens, and then sometimes that second injury is not that big a deal. It may be something that normally would never have caused a concussion in them. So it can be a pretty innocuous event. But what happens is, is that your, your uh, blood vessels in the brain, instead of being normal, they all dilate. And when they dilate, they increase the pressure in your brain, and that squishes your brain and it, and it kills you. It has 100% either significant morbidity, which means that the person is in a coma, even if they recover from the coma, they have permanent brain damage and they struggle with normal daily functions in life, or they die. So that is the outcome of the second impact syndrome. There have been a ton of case reports in the medical literature on this, so individual cases, and there's even been case series where an individual doctor has seen 20 cases of this. And originally we thought that this was all in athletes that were young. It's so people less than 18 years of age. We thought, oh, well, this is, this is an injury of the immature brain, so we need to be really careful in junior high and high school athletes, but not, not really worry about it in somebody who gets a little bit older. But there have been more reports of people who are in their 20s and even up into their 30s that have had second impact syndrome. So maybe kids are suscept more susceptible to it, but everybody can have it. And so it's significant for all populations, and people need to know about that. And there was a case here in top of this so happened. Very tragic. So while you can't do a prospective randomized trial where you take concussed athletes with symptoms and you let them go and play, and you take concussed athletes with no symptoms, you know, and you, you don't let them play until their symptoms resolve, you see who has a bad outcome. Yeah, like there that. certainly is enough literature out there right now to suggest that, that this is a significant problem. It does seem to happen in specific populations. It's in people who haven't had resolution of their symptoms, and so we need to be aware of this 
and to treat concussions appropriately. So as far as epidemiology, this, this is incredibly pre prevalent. Four million sports-related concussions per year just in the United States. And that's probably an incredible underestimate because what they're getting this data from are ERs. Yeah. How many kids are at a football game or go and ski in their, or snowboard and they catch their back edge and bonk their head on the ground, they get up, they have a horrible headache, they feel horrible, they go home, they never go to the ER. I mean, I would say it's probably one in 20 actually goes to the ER because almost everybody just goes home and they, they think they're going to sleep it off and take an aspirin and stuff. So, four million, it's probably, you know, 20 million. It's probably way more than that. But that's the data that we've got from National Institute of Health. In high school sports, the most common sport that causes uh, concussions is football. But something that I think is really interesting is if you look down here, in sports that have female and male uh, counterparts, females have a higher incidence of concussions, girls' soccer and girls' basketball. And when we go up to college athletics, again, yeah, football, most concussions, but when we isolate men's and women's soccer, women have a higher concussion rate. We don't know why that is, but being female predisposes you to having a concussion. It predisposes you to have a longer recovery more symptoms, more severity in terms of post-concussive uh, syndrome. And so, you know, it's, uh, that's a big deal. We don't know why there's a gender difference with that. In professional sports, obviously, it's, it's uh, very common. But it does look like there are more concussions in the immature brain, so the younger athletes, than as we, as we get older. Now, the question is, is, do we have less concussions in the older age group, or is it that in high school you play football, you got a couple of concussions, and you're like, I'm not going to go and play college. Or you make it through high school, no concussions, you get a couple in college, and you're like, I am not going and playing professional. So gradually the people who are susceptible to concussions just don't progress to that next level. So that's a possibility, and there's also the possibility of underreporting. People who are in college and are on scholarship, and the number one love what they do, they're getting their education paid for, um, there's a lot of pressure from coaches, from their teammates, their parents. Uh, so as you go up from high school to college to professional, people are more and more likely to try to hide their symptoms and hide their injury because of the ramifications of telling people that they've got a concussion. There hasn't been any studies specifically looking at concussion incidents in ski and snowboarding, but there have been in brain injuries as a whole. And so when you look at uh, brain injuries as a whole, the majority of them are mild. So, and this is where concussions typically are going to fall into is your mild category. 5% moderate, 14% severe. I thought this was pretty interesting though. 4% of brain injuries in ski accidents result in death. That's a, that's a huge deal. And the majority of these brain injuries happen in athletes that run into a tree. Um, and it's worse when you just look at these athletes who ran into a tree they have a higher mortality rate. So don't run into trees is the moral of the story. Of course, the people who get these injuries are males. They have higher risk behaviors, snowboarders, longer arms, it throws their balance off. <laughs> and people under 35 years of age, because they all feel that they're invulnerable. Yeah. I can do anything. You know, I can do this gap jump. It's not a problem. I know there's a tree there. So uh, why do we care about concussions? Number one, anytime you've got a concussion, you have a much higher risk of sustaining future concussion. So a three to five times higher risk of concussion. So getting one means you're gonna get more. You can have post-concussive syndrome. And this, anybody who's had this, it just stinks. They get headaches, they're having difficulty concentrating, light bothersome, sound bothersome, they can't concentrate, they go to school and they struggle, they can't go to work, they're driving their car and they can be confused and can't find their way home. Post-concussion syndrome is a real drag, and it can happen the first time you get your concussion, or it can be after your 10th concussion. But if you get it, it stinks, and it's variable in terms of how long it lasts. You can have a catastrophic injury, we talked about those. Or you can get this thing called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And this is getting a lot of press now. So chronic traumatic encephalopathy begins with personality changes in sort of late middle age. So uh, somebody who's 42, 
Um, and they, it starts off with volatility and depression. And these are a lot of the athletes who are retiring from sports and they start going through depression, they have, you know, they get angry, throw stuff and everything, and then they commit suicide. So this is, this is the age group and these are the presenting symptoms, but then it progresses and you can develop Alzheimer's, so a loss of memory or an Alzheimer's-like uh, process. You can get movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, look at Muhammad Ali. Or you can have motor neuron disease, and some people suggest that Lou Gehrig's disease, which is ALS, there may be an association between prior concussions and the development of ALS. Not that there's a one-to-one -one relationship, meaning that you're going to get ALS if you had a concussion, or you can't have ALS if you haven't had a concussion. But people who have had concussions seem to have a higher predisposition to develop ALS, and ALS is universally fatal, so it's not something that anybody wants. So. The person who did a lot of the research on this is Anne McKee, and she's a, she's a pathologist out in Boston. She works at the University of Boston, and her specialty is Alzheimer's. And so she was doing autopsies on brains of people with Alzheimer's. And she started finding this different pathology in people who they thought had Alzheimer's. And so they had diffuse atrophy of their brains, but then they had this really prominent enlargement of one of the holes inside of your brain called a ventricle. It was really big and it was way different than any of the other Alzheimer's brains that she looked at. And then an area in your brain that has to do with movement that's usually, it has dark pig pigmentation in it, it had uh, gotten lighter. And then she started doing some histologic studies where she would dye parts of the brain and she found that there was this tau protein that was deposited in odd places that no Alzheimer's patients or anybody else who haven't had chronic repetitive brain injuries had. And it's in specific areas that have to do with movement and memory. And they didn't have the characteristic findings of Alzheimer's, which are neuritic plaques. So she's like, wait a second, I'm discovering a whole new pathology, a whole new disorder. And so she named it to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And it has been found in all sorts of different athletes. So football, hockey, boxing, all sorts of athletes in different contact sports. It's even been seen in athletes as long, young as 18 years old. And it's tragic that she's had to do autopsies on kids as young as 18. But this can be car accidents, it can be suicide, it can be a lot of different things, but people have donated their brains and she has found the beginnings of this chronic traumatic encephalopathy in contact sport athletes, very, very young. The other interesting thing is there was an athlete from Penn State, or not Penn State, from uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, you know, really high academic standards, super smart guy, had never reported a history of concussions, he was on their football team, went through a serious bout of depression, committed suicide, and left a note saying, I want my brain to be donated to this project. And when they did the autopsy on his brain, sure enough, he had abnormalities consistent with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. For early stages, but still the same pathology that you see in these older athletes. And what that is saying is that subclinical concussions are happening. People don't even know that they're having them. And you could ask somebody on the sidelines, do you have a headache, do you have any problems? And they'll say no, and, they, and they're being honest. But those repetitive, sub-concussive blows to the head are causing damage. And we're seeing that now as we're starting to look for it more. So what can we do? Well, number one, preventing concussions. Number two, when somebody's had a concussion, identifying them early, treating them appropriately, and uh, returning them to play in the safest manner possible. So how do we prevent them? Well, I think one of the best things you can do in terms of prevention is identifying people who are at risk. And the people who are at risk are people who have had prior concussions. So when we do pre-participation physicals, one of the questions on the form is, have you ever had you know, a, a concussion in the past? And if somebody checks that, immediately, whoever's doing that pre-participation physical as a physician should be counseling that athlete that they're at risk, these are the potential outcomes, and they need to make an educated decision about whether they want to participate in a high-risk sport. Number two, younger athletes. So high school, more so than college, more so than professional. And when you're young and you have a traumatic brain injury, 
your brain is still developing. So if you're in junior high and you're normally going to be getting more and more cognitive abilities, more and more coordination, all the stuff from your brain is developing as you're going through normal uh, growth and development through, you know, all the way until you're an adult. If you have a brain injury, it halts that and it sets you back. And so it takes a while to get back up to where you were before. So they're more susceptible not only to having a brain injury, but also it slows them down in terms of milestones. Females are more at risk for male than males, and there does appear to be a genetic component. We don't have a blood test yet that you can take. But these two genetic markers have, in, in one study each, uh, had some suggestion that they may be uh, predisposing factors associated with concussions. Well, then everybody says, okay, helmets. That's the answer. We're just going to make better helmets. And so in terms of football, there was a study looking at the new concussion helmets. And it was a three-year study. Uh, looking at the Rydell Revolution, which is a concussion helmet, and they had a bunch of people in this. It was over a thousand athletes that had this Rydell Revolution, and it was compared to just the standard school helmet. And they found that there was a slightly smaller incidence of concussions in the Rydell group compared to the standard helmet group, and it was statistically significant. But there are some problems with this. In number one, Rydell sponsored the study brought in their experts, fit the helmet, made sure that they were brand new helmets and that all of them were perfectly set up on athletes and educated them on concussions and so on. And the other kids got whatever helmet the school had, which, you know, if the helmets aren't replaced each year, the pads wear out. It's probably the custodian fitting the helmet, putting it on, kind of shaking around. I mean, you've seen kids where they're looking out the ear hole after they have a hit. I mean, they're not comparing apples to apples. They're definitely two, it's very different. And if you look at this incidence, even with that uh, taking into consideration that the helmets may not have been a really good comparison, it was almost the same. It was within 1.5% essentially. And that's not much. So if you have a whole bunch of people, you can make a study that's statistically significant, even with small changes. But is it clinically significant? Is a 1% difference? clinically significant and worth, you know, I'd say that that's probably within the realm of error. However, with skiing and uh, cycling, it seems like helmets might make a difference. It's probably because the mechanism of injury is different. Uh, certainly, helmets prevent skull fracture. I am not a proponent of people not wearing helmets. If you're in football, the original, the original reason that they developed helmets with hard shells in football is because people were dying from skull fractures. Last year before hard shell helmets, they had 16 deaths, all from skull fractures. They put hard shell helmets on them, zero deaths from skull fractures. They had a bunch of spinal cord injuries though, because people now started battering each other with their heads and spear tackling. So then they had to change the rules of the game so people weren't spear tackling, and that helped prevent spinal cord injuries. But the fact of the matter is, is that Helmets weren't developed to prevent concussions. They were developed to prevent skull fractures, and they do a great job at that. But they're not great with concussions. I still think that they should be worn both with football and skiing and snowboarding and stuff. And stuff. One of the biggest problems with the helmets is that the standards that they use to certify a helmet are based on linear acceleration. Now remember when I was telling you, if you hold your head in one place and you smack it, then you can actually have a skull fracture without any change in the level of consciousness and the neurologic function. So it's, it's a great way of looking at focal trauma, but not a good job at predicting the potential for protecting against concussions. You really are going to have to develop a test that looks at angular acceleration. And since both of these things are really important in terms of how a helmet functions, they should probably be testing them when they're doing helmet standards. But regardless, because a helmet is not holding your head in one place and your head can still whip around, helmets are probably not going to be the answer. So some people think, well, maybe if we monitor the g-forces in a helmet, we stick these accelerometers in helmets, and we monitor on the sidelines uh, or at rinkside in hockey or you know snowboarding and stuff, and we see that they have a specific acceleration, angular or linear acceleration in their helmet, that that person's had a concussion and they get pulled out. So we can use this as a threshold marker. And in fact. Most concussions happen at a linear uh, velocity greater than 100 Gs or an angular uh, 
uh, velocity of greater than 5,000 radians per second. But the problem is, is that a bunch of concussions happened at much lower thresholds. And there were a bunch of people who didn't sustain a concussion that were above that. So it was a very hazy line. I mean, yeah, when you looked at it statistically, that was the line. Most of them happened above that. But it wasn't a real hard and fast rule. And these are really expensive. Um, and there haven't been any studies really looking at it in snowboarding and skiing. So how clinically uh, applicable is this? I mean, you're going to be able to use it in real life. It, it probably is more of a research tool at this point. So mouth guards. I was actually listening to the radio probably a year ago, and somebody was marketing a concussion prevention mouth guard that yeah. would set off a beep or change color or something when it said you had a concussion. And I was like, you got to be kidding. They definitely reduce spore facial trauma. But they don't do anything in terms of concussions because, again, they do not control head movements. They're great to wear, really important. They protect your teeth and your lips, but they're not going to prevent concussions. So don't buy that thing that tells you if you have a concussion. It's, um, it's crazy. I think rule changes are one of the big things that we can do that, that would be effective. So there was a study looking at the NHL, and they they looked at all the data on the athletes who had sustained concussions in the NHL over a 10-year period. And of course, all these things are televised, and they're televised from a bunch of different camera angles. So they had access to all the videotapes, and they went back and looked at every hit that caused every document of concussion. They found that about 80% of those hits were to the head. And so the thought is, Boy, if you just say, don't hit the head, you can check all you want, but just don't hit the head, that you would immediately reduce the incidence of concussions by 80%, which is pretty dramatic. Um, they have not done that yet, but that is, is one argument. I mean, you can get concussions other ways, but that's, that's pretty significant, and it wouldn't make the sports that much less violent, and everybody's into you know, violent sports at this point. I guess the MMA is the... It's the most, it's the hottest sport right now. You know, and they're trying to kill each other. What is the MMA? It's the mixed martial arts. It's the ultimate fight fighting, fighting where there are no gloves and they're just beating each other bloody. People love it. So the other thing is, of course, the existing rules. There are a lot of rules that are meant to protect athletes. And uh, one of the conferences that we held at Mayo, um, one of the doctors I worked with there, he was the head team physician for the U.S. hockey team. He actually has three kids in the NHL right now. I mean, it's an amazing family. And he was the head team doc at the Olympics this last Winter Olympics in Vancouver for, for the hockey team. So he's really into hockey, and we had a hockey summit for concussion prevention. And we brought in athletes, um, officials, you know, the refs, uh, league officials who were the management of the NHL, and uh, Hockey Canada, and USA Hockey, um, and then a bunch of the scientists uh, and the people who produced all the different equipment. And everybody kind of presented their different data and we got into small work groups and talked about ways of trying to prevent uh, concussions. And one of the presentations was by Carrie, uh, uh, I think it's Carrie Lynch, Carrie something, I can't think of his last name, but he's a very, very famous hockey official, Carrie Frazier. And uh, he said that USA Hockey, or excuse me, the NHL came out with a new rule saying that you couldn't hit an athlete, a, a hockey player, in the head if they weren't, if they didn't have the puck. So if they were, didn't have the puck and they were just kind of skating across the ice, you couldn't blindside them and drill them in the head to try to put them out of the game, which is something that actually was happening, happening fairly frequently. After that rule was implemented, the first game that Kerry was out there uh, refing, he saw two of those, and he kicked both players out, and they were supposed to have a, a ten or twenty thousand dollar fine, which is not a big deal for him, but you know, it's relatively substantial. The NHL reviews every single game after after the game and looks at all the calls, and they overturned both both of his calls, and. The players weren't fined, and Kerry was scolded for having called it. But if you look at the videotape, there's no doubt that he made the right call. But what it meant is that all the other refs in the league were like, oh, wait a second. They don't actually want us to enforce this, so we're not going to enforce it. And so it made a rule on the books 
that was not actually implemented. And it was a big deal. And he went to the press about it and he got in a lot of trouble. And it was, I mean, it was a big deal. But if they actually allow refs to enforce the existing rules, and the NFL is really trying to do this, then it can have effect and, and protect people in games. Now, legislation is one of the things that's happening around the country right now. And it's all based on the Leistat Law, which was up in Washington State. And the Leistat Law is is from a child uh, who sustained second impact syndrome. Now, he did survive, but he is severely impaired. And that pushed through legislation uh, in Washington state, and they named it after, after this uh, child. Now, California has mimicked the Washington law, and the majority of the states in the United States now have a similar law. Um, and the one that was passed in California was done in October of 2011 and it was implemented in January of this year. And what it says is that all athletes and their parents or guardians must review a concussion information sheet every year. It just kind of educates them on what a concussion is, and they have to sign it. If an athlete is suspected of having a concussion, they have to be removed from that uh, competition that day, and they can't be allowed to go back into competition that day. They have to be evaluated by a medical uh, provider before they're allowed to return to any type of sports. And that medical provider is supposed to be trained in the management of concussions, and they have to be acting within their scope of practice. Now, this is good and it's bad. The good part is, is that it's increasing concussion awareness. It's telling athletes if they do sustain a concussion, you're not going to go back in that day, and they do have to go and see somebody that's a healthcare provider. The problem is, is that it doesn't define who that healthcare provider is, it doesn't say what the training is. So that healthcare provider could be a dermatologist who read Sports Illustrated and said, oh, I know about concussions. I mean, it could be anybody. Now that being said, if somebody had, is a licensed healthcare provider in California and they release an athlete uh, and sign the waiver saying that they're ready to go back, they also are very liable. And so the hope is, is that it's going to be somewhat self-regulated, where people aren't going to be willing to take on the liability associated with concussion management if they're not trained. But there are certainly plenty of people who are, you know, willing to do stuff out of their scope of practice. Um, so it's, it's a bit unfortunate. I think that one of the biggest things is education. So I'm glad you guys are all here today. The athletes, the coaches, Parents, the refs all need to learn about concussions. I was just wondering if you were doing in service for all like the pediatric and doctors and other just family practitioners in town. And I did it for the ER docs. I offered to do it for um, the primary care physicians and didn't hear back. Um, you know, I've. This type of thing was marketed pretty heavily at Barton. Like the clinic too, you know, the Barton Clinic. Yeah, it's funny because I I offer to give a presentation fairly often and people just don't take you up on it very often, which is, is unfortunate. And I think it is because a lot of people do think that they know what to do, which, you know, I, and I hope they do. I hope they do. So I think it's also important to learn how to, how to contact people uh, appropriately, make tackles appropriately, check in hockey and so on. And a good preseason conditioning program is really important for injury prevention as a whole. We find that most injuries happen towards the end of the day, towards the end of the competition, when people are fatigued, they can't control themselves well, they can't avoid somebody that's going to hit them, and so you know it's the last run of the day where somebody blows their ACL or runs into a tree, or it's the fourth quarter of the game where they get drilled by an opponent, and it's just because they're standing there and they're exhausted and the opponent ran right into them. So, uh, as far as identification and management, there have been several different uh, publications over the years in grading scales where somebody would get hit, and if they had symptoms for X period of time or X type of symptoms, then they would be considered to have a grade 1 or a 2 or a 3 concussion. And based on what, whether they had a 1, 2, or 3 would determine how long they would be out for. So the day of the competition, you made the recommendation that they were either out for a long time or they were able to return to competition that same day, whether it was one, two, or three. The problem was that all these different recommendations used different criteria to grade a one versus a two versus a three. 
And then they also had different recommendations in terms of what you do if it's a one, two, or three. So some said if you've got a one, you can go back to competition that day. Others said you have to be out for a week. And so there was just this mishmash of non-evidence-based recommendations all on the day of the injury. And that is totally invalid, oh, yeah. I think, because with my concussion, I didn't even feel it until the next day. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, that's a perfect case. The next case day, on the first day, I didn't even know. Yeah, it's it's amazing. So that's that's one of the things they they've had this international concussion conference that took together all sorts of people who were experts in concussion. They reviewed all the literature, and they've met three different times and made specific recommendations. One of the main recommendations that they made is that you cannot grade the severity of a concussion on the day of a concussion. Somebody could have a loss of consciousness that seems really dramatic. You know, it's 30 seconds, they're laying out there. They get up, they're confused, they have problems, but in two days they're fine. Or somebody could have uh, injury, seem like they're fine, not even report any symptoms. On the bus ride home, they say, well, I've got a headache. The next day, they have a horrible headache, and they're struggling in school. And then for two months, they just can't get, you know, they're struggling along with these post-concussive symptoms. At the time of the injury, totally different presentations. One, almost nothing. The other one, a dramatic loss of consciousness that has everybody, you know, really excited about it but very different outcomes. And so that's the big thing. You can only grade a concussion after they've completed recovery. And then you can say, oh, it took you two months. But you can't tell them at the beginning how long it's gonna take. You have to have a plan. And you guys can't really see this, but this is our concussion plan. And it talks about preseason testing of people, what you're gonna do on the field, who goes to the emergency room, uh, who goes home with their parents, and then uh, what you do in terms of the clinic follow-up. But I think you have to have a plan in order to have a good concussion program. So part of our plan is the preseason part. We do baseline testing. And I think that a lot of people now, there is a computer-based test called IMPACT. And IMPACT is incredibly pervasive across the United States now. And there are goods and bads about impact. One of the goods is, is that it's really increased concussion awareness. And it gives you a tool that is a basic neuropsychological test that looks at reaction time and pattern recognition. But those are the only two realms that it really looks at well. And people think that it is the be-all, end-all of concussion treatment. And so a lot of schools are buying this, doing baseline testing, not even having any medical person involved at all. And they just have the kids after they've had a possible concussion repeat this impact until it's normal and then they let the kid go back in. But it is only one small part of the concussion puzzle. It's an important part, I think, because it's a screening tool, but it's only one small part. And the other problem with it is it doesn't help with sideline management. When Joey or Betty or whoever comes off of the field and says, I'm fine, I'm fine, and the players next to him are like, you know, but she's going in there, or he's going in there, and he doesn't know what play it is, and he's acting kind of funny. Impact doesn't help you make the decision to pull that player out of the game, because it's, they have to be in a quiet environment, it takes 30 minutes to do the test. It's not something that helps on the, in the heat of the moment. And let me tell you, having been, you know, I work with the U.S. ski team, and I also was uh, the head team physician for a Division I college for a bunch of years. And the coach is in your face, the parents are in your face, and the athlete's in your face. And they're all saying, I'm fine and I need to get back out there. And you need to have some way of saying, you're not fine, and you need to be able to stand your ground. And it really helps to have some objective measures that you can do on the sideline. That you're like, look, this is how they were before, and this is how they are now. There's no way this is normal. That settles people down. Uh, so at any rate, one of the things that you can do is a thing called the SCAT-2. And this is a form that came out of that uh, big concussion summit, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And it looks at uh, concussion symptoms. It also is a very brief screening test for cognition, your thought process, and how your memory is. But it also tests your balance. Um, <clears throat> we also were starting to work with Wii's, because, you know, with Wii Fitness, it can test your balance. And so you can do baseline testing with Wii's and then have a Wii in the locker room and it takes two minutes to do that and kids dig it. So I, I think the Wii is a really good tool and it's been validated against a very expensive force plate. So I, I think 
cool. In the clinic, though, you can do a lot more. Not only can you do that SCAT 2, but you can also do a computer-based test. It doesn't have to be impact, it can be any of them. But it can be a computer-based test, and you can do balance tests there. So what I think is good is having this baseline data. Some can be used on the sideline, and some can be used in the clinic. The ones that are in the clinic are the higher level tests, stuff that takes longer and is more specific, but doesn't necessarily help you the data of competition. But you print out all of this information that's from the sideline, and you stick it in the medical bag at the sideline so that you've got all that information there with the patient, the athlete's name, and what all of their baseline scores are. Um, and then the next thing is just you practice your sideline coverage. When you're at a game, it's really important to keep your eye on the game. If you have a doctor or an athletic trainer, and the game is over here, and they spend the whole time watching the cheerleaders or chatting with the other coaches, and they're not watching the game, they're not doing their job. They have to watch the game because you do not know when so a lot of times people get injured and they do not tell you. But if you see a player go into a big pileup, and get up and run to the wrong sideline, and then the other players turn them around and push them your way, you know that player's got to be evaluated. And if you weren't watching the game, you may never have known that happened. So you've got to keep your eye on the game. And anybody who you suspect of having a concussion, the first thing you do is, is evaluate for any life-threatening injury. Obviously, if they have a C-spine injury and they happen, you know, if you get hit in the head, you lose consciousness and you wake up, you should immediately be immobilizing their head because when they're unconscious and then they wake up, they're going to move around. And if they have a cervical spine injury, they might not be paralyzed yet, but they can paralyze themselves from waking up and moving around. So you always mobilize their head and you look at their head first. Then you do all the rest of everything and you make sure that they're you know, breathing and so on. If they have any significant injury, they go to the hospital. If they don't and they're just confused or they have a loss of consciousness, but they wake up and you know, they're answering your questions, they don't have any focal neurologic deficits, meaning they can move their arms and their legs, you don't suspect a bleed in their brain, their neck seems okay, you take them off to the side, and you evaluate them on the sideline. And at that time, you do a history. So one of the things I ask in the history is, have you ever had a concussion before? You ask them about signs and symptoms, and I'll show you in this SCAT 2, it has all the signs and symptoms listed, so you can just go to, down that litany of symptoms. And there's a whole bunch of symptoms that can be somatic, like headaches or cognitive, such as memory problems, behavioral sleep, and so on. This over here, which again, I'm sorry the screen is so far away from me, but it's like, it has on there headache, pressure in your head, um, neck pain, and so on. So you just say, okay, on a zero to six scale, six being bad, zero being nothing. Do you have any of these? And then you just sit there and you read down that list and you mark off on there what they've got. So are the high school, you know, you're at the high school, so do the coaches, are they supposed to have these? No, Is the it trainer like, should. And the high schools here, we have trainers in it, so the trainers should be ready to go with all of this in their bags. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. But if you're in a sport where there's not a trainer, yeah. then I think the coaches should go through concussion training, which they, you know, the National Federation of High School has, and also the NIH, they have some really good concussion, uh, they have very good concussion information, and certain coaches, in order to get licensing, have to go through concussion training. It's pretty basic, though. But it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. So, and this SCAT 2 is super easy, you know, and, and doing the baseline testing on them is easy, too. You just get a few people, and you read through, and you ask them all the questions, and you do all the testing, and then you have a score, and you keep it on a spreadsheet. It's right there on the sideline. If you have somebody who might get a concussion, you just go through the same thing and compare scores. So the physical examination, you have them look at their C-spine. You know, if you ever suspect a C-spine injury, that person goes to the hospital. That's a serious injury. There's a basic cognitive screen. You also look at their cranial nerve strength and sensation. And in sensation, we look at balance and coordination. And also just check for reflexes. This is that SCAT 2 again. And it has the basic cognitive assessment, so it asks some basic stuff like what month is it, and, uh, and so on. It asks them some memory things, and it does both uh, immediate and delayed recall. It does some concentration stuff. You say three numbers forwards, and they have to tell you those numbers backwards. And, and as you guys know, some people are rocket scientists, and some people aren't. If you don't have this baseline information, you just may not know how they would normally score. So you really need that baseline information 
in order to be able to compare to what they should be normally. So, you know what I was going to say, like if you if there is no trainer, you know, for soccer at the high school or whatnot, you got one of these and you did a big sign on your channel and how right. and he was complaining you could always just do that for yourself. Absolutely. Do you know what right. I mean? Like right. that's what I would do with yeah. if you don't have that's, that's very smart and Absolutely. This is an easy thing that anybody can do. It doesn't require any specialized equipment or specialized training. I mean, it, it has instructions. It says, now you say, but, you know, you just read it. It's really easy. Well, it seems like the athletic department would you know, have this. Uh, it, it, it seems like they should. Yeah. So, I mean, we have the athletic trainers there, but actually, it would be great to... I gave a very brief presentation down in Douglas High School last year when all of the students and their uh, parents had to go and sign up for sports. But they gave me five minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's hard to give a good... One, yeah. All you can say is concussions are bad. <laughs> and the second one's worse. Yeah, Who is the athletic director of high school? Um, it's Russell. Russell. It's Russell now. I mean, I mean, it's you know, it's definitely it's not like this is De La Salle where they have a trainer at every single event has right. someone there. You know, so I don't know who we yeah, have at every sport is now. So I mean, maybe that's a good uh, a good point. I'll talk to Chris Proctor, who is the basketball coach yeah. here. He runs up yeah, he runs he's our manager of our practice. Maybe they can set up a time for me to educate the coaches and the uh, yeah, the athletic that would be great. director. Certainly, the yeah. And so this is the balance test that you do, and it's really easy also. You essentially just have the athletes stand with their feet together, their hands on their hips, and their eyes closed for 20 seconds. Then you have them do it with one foot in front of the other with their eyes closed for 20 seconds, and then you have them do it on one leg with their eyes closed for 20 seconds. And again, it's amazing because some people can stand there rock solid, no problem, and other people are just all over the place, and you have to have that baseline in order to know what their balance is beforehand. Mm -hmm. But it is easy if they lift their hand off their hip, that's a score. If they open their eyes up, that's a score. If they take a step, that's a score. And it tells you how to score it on the sheet, so pretty easy. Oh, and there's a little pocket one that, that athletic trainers and or coaches or parents can keep on the sideline that's very easy to keep in their pocket. So after you've figured out that the athlete has had a concussion, the first thing you do is you take them out of the competition. Do not let them go back to the competition. Football players, I always just took their helmet. Because then they can't, you know, they're stuck if you've got their helmet and you can carry their helmet around the rest of the competition. Always monitor them for a change in their mentation. Because one of the big things that can happen is you think they've got a concussion, but when in fact they've got a bleed in their brain, and that's way more serious, because that'll kill them now. Concussion usually will kill you in the future if you have a second impact, but I believe your brain will kill you now. So if you monitor them, and at first they're a little confused, but they're doing okay, and they seem to be getting better, wonderful. But if they're a little bit confused, and then suddenly their speech starts slurring, and they start getting a facial droop, and they start being more confused, that person needs immediate hospital transportation in an ambulance, and they're going to they're gonna be in neurosurgery, you know, Immediately, it's just I've been in a competition where, unfortunately, this has happened. You know, it's funny because my career has only been about 12 years, but I've covered a lot of sporting events, and uh, and I've seen spinal cord injuries and you know, broken all sorts of stuff. But this was one of the most dramatic. It was a brain bleed, and it was the typical thing. The person came out, seemed fine, did the examination, was sitting there, got up and started walking, and then started listing to the right. Fell into the you know the seats that were on the side, started seizing, uh, you know, and he ended up it didn't it didn't go well. He, you know, they took him to the hospital, and but by the time they got him to the hospital and drained the blood clot, he was in a coma for several days, and then his parents decided to pull uh, the plug, I and mean, he died. And so it was really horrible. He had a congenital abnormality of very aneurysm. You can't predict that stuff. You don't know which kids might have it. Concussions can present it the same way that this is going to present. So you have to monitor them on the sidelines, make sure somebody's not going downhill. If they go downhill, they go to the hospital immediately. If they do okay during the game, and most of the time people start getting a little bit better, then you can let them go home, but you want to make sure that they're going home to a supervised environment.